The Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon is one of the printers I lean most on when I need to crank out parts for a project or other build. And while I've mostly left it stock, today we're going to change that. Due to its popularity, tons of upgrades and accessories have been coming out for this machine. With so many options, I wanted to cover as many as I possibly could in one video so that anyone interested could see them in action. These were provided by various manufacturers and consist of everything from lighting, hot ends, filters, build plates, and more. For anyone interested in a specific item, I will have timestamps available. So with all that being said and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Thanks to Voxel PLA for sponsoring today's video. Used exclusively in a 150 machine print farm, they now offer 21 colors of PLA Plus and 10 colors of PETG Plus. Both are available at the low price of $16.99. This is an excellent choice for anyone needing reliable and affordable materials, even for more demanding applications. Filament performance is excellent even on high-speed printers. Bulk discounts are available along with free shipping in the US when you order three or more rolls. Voxel PLA also provides high-quality 3D printer upgrades such as the Bento Box 2-stage filter and the Bamboo Lab AMS Python along with many others. Check out the link in the description to voxelpla.com to find out more about their high quality affordable filaments and printer upgrades. Before diving in, I did want to clarify that the X1 Carbon is a great printer as is, and most of these upgrades are just quality of life improvements. Mine's been out of warranty for a while, and just recently I've had some inconsistent extrusion that I'm hoping we'll be able to resolve when we get inside the tool head. We're going to bounce around as we go through these, but the first few are from BQ. BQ released a line of products specifically for Bamboo Lab printers called Panda. A few have been out for some time, but they recently expanded their catalog. Starting with the Panda door. This is a replacement for the stock glass door and is made of polycarbonate. It comes in yellow, orange, and black, with black being the one that we're installing. The main purpose of this is to remove the risk of accidentally shattering that front glass door. While, knock on wood, this isn't something I've experienced, I've gotten to see this happen live. Installing it is a piece of cake. It's the exact same form factor as the default glass door and reuses its hardware. There's two screws for the handle and two screws for each of the hinges. There's little rubber inserts to prevent accidentally cracking the door, but be sure to hand tighten and not torque down too hard on these. I was curious to see if visibility was any different because the glass door has a pretty dark tint, so I grabbed a before and after shot with a squirtle print sitting on the bed. While it's somewhat subtle, the PC door does provide slightly better visibility inside of the printer. Next up, we have Panda Fur, which is a cosmetic wrap for the P1S or X1 Carbon printers. This comes in pink, brown, or orange, and we're installing the orange on my X1 Carbon. Panda fur comes in a tube and consists of four pieces, one for each side and a smaller piece for the front, top, and bottom. It includes a small X-Acto knife and scraper for cutting and applying the material, but requires two printed parts that act as a guide to aid in cutting. One of the parts is relatively small, but the other is a decent sized print that even on a quick printer took an hour or two to complete. There's a video guide that goes over the installation process, but even with that, I had my fair share of struggles. Installation feels similar to installing a very large screen protector on a phone, but even with what I thought was me being careful, I ended up with some air bubbles on the larger sides. The printed guides are helpful, but it does leave an imperfect tear on the tops and bottoms. The other thing I realized was that the side pieces actually cover the back panel screws that need to be removed when doing things like swapping the bed cable. This is something we recently did, so I'm hoping I'll get a thousand plus hours before having to revisit it, but it feels like an oversight. The product page says it's scratch, stain, and fingerprint resistant, which I believe, but the claims about better insulation and noise reduction I would take with a grain of salt. Really, I see this as a cosmetic upgrade more than anything, and while the basketball look of my X1 Carbon has grown on me, it feels like a fairly niche item. Moving on to the tool head, we're installing the new Diamondback hot end released by E3D. I'm running Diamondbacks on three of my other printers, and while they're pricey, they are very high quality and might be my favorite nozzle type for any heavy abrasive printing. We looked at the E3D High Flow Obsidian upgrade earlier this year, and one piece of feedback I saw by many in the comments 
was they wished it came fully assembled and didn't require the harvesting of the heater, thermistor, and fans from another hot end. Well, E3D listened to the feedback, and this Diamondback hot end is plug and play out of the box. While we're taking apart the tool head, we're also installing the Panda Claw extruder gear. This replaces the stock plastic gear with a nano coated hardened steel gear and CNC tension arm. For anyone that hasn't taken apart the tool head or swapped out the hot end, it's a fairly simple process. Two screws hold the hot end in place, and three hold the extruder in place. You need to loosen the screw holding the blade into the extruder and swing it out of the way. The cables are fairly small, but disconnecting them from the tool head is straightforward, and they're all different sizes, which prevents you from accidentally reinstalling them incorrectly. Once you have the extruder out, there's four screws to remove that hold the two housing halves together, and one screw to remove for the tension. When I got the extruder open, I also found the source of my extrusion issues. There was quite a bit of filament debris caked onto the grooves that feed the filament. For anyone having extrusion issues randomly, or if you have a maintenance schedule, it might not be a bad idea to get into the extruder and clean it occasionally. The BQ Claw comes with two new bearings that as far as I can tell are identical to the stock ones, and everything goes back in the same way. The one difference is that you need to install grease on those gears. This is pretty messy, and I strongly recommend throwing some gloves on before. I cut the grease packet at the corner and applied it to the large gear teeth and to the two extruder gear teeth. Make sure you don't get this in the filament path, and it's not a bad idea to take some swabs or a napkin after to clean those channels out. Reinstall the extruder the same way you removed it, along with the hot end, and plug all cables back in. After I had everything back together, I turned the printer on and checked that the fan, temperature, and heater were all working, and ran a test print to make sure I had no issue with the new gears. I printed out Wexter's new creepy pumpkin model in a dual colored filament that turned out awesome and confirmed that everything was swapped successfully. Next, I installed the Panda Lux LED upgrade kit. This replaces the stock lights on the left side with a brighter LED bar that mounts at the top front of the printer. The LEDs come on a magnetic bracket that makes attaching and removing them really simple. It does require installing a little PCB to the AP board, which is a small board located inside the upper top of the printer. You unplug the stock LED cable, plug the adapter board into its place, and then plug the new LEDs into that adapter board. The board has double-sided adhesive on it, so the last step is to peel it and stick it somewhere out of the way. While there is a second port on it that fits the stock LEDs, you don't want to run both as it draws too much power and will lead to issues. For now, I left the stock LEDs inside the machine, but I may end up removing them in the future. I threw Squirtle back in the printer to see what visibility was like compared to before with the stock door and stock lights, and it definitely gives better coverage and makes it much easier to see inside of the machine while it's closed. Now it's time for some filtration. A huge percentage of what I print on the X1 Carbon is ABS or ASA, and with this printer being up in the studio where I work, it's something I wish I'd done much sooner. I did end up getting a HEPA filter for the entire room, but cycling the air inside of the printer before it leaves is even better. For this, we're using the Bento Box, a two-stage filter with HEPA and activated carbon that uses two fans to pull air through the tower. This is a project created by Through the Frame, and the parts can be printed and self-sourced. Voxel PLA also has the hardware and filters available, or a complete unit that's assembled, which is what I'm installing. The fans are 12 volts, and I'll be using a 24 volt power supply for the next mod, so I installed a tiny 12 volt buck converter I purchased a while back for a different project to step down the voltage. There's a groove on the bottom of the housing for alignment with the groove inside the printer, and a hole for an M3 screw that secures it to the bottom panel to hold it in place. I fed the two wires through the hole on the other side of the printer's base, which exits the machine so I can tie them into the power supply in just a moment. A year ago, we looked at the BL LED controller, a small ESP32 based board that lets you control RGB LEDs wirelessly and it uses MQTT to adjust the color for various states on the printer. I ended up swapping it out to another printer in the garage, so we're going to get this hooked up on the X1 Carbon. The specific version we're using is the Extended, which includes a large external antenna for better wireless signal. Since the last video, a fair bit has changed with the project as far as install, and there's a really nice custom dashboard that you can access to set the behaviors and brightness of the LEDs. 
The first step is to print out the riser that we're going to attach the LEDs to. Before doing this, I swapped out the bed for a G11 plate made by VPS Data. For anyone not familiar, Garolite G11 is a fiberglass material compressed with resin. I've had some experience with Garolite in the past, but it's primarily been with nylon, and it's been quite a few years since I've actually used it. It's supposed to have wide material compatibility and leave a fairly smooth texture on the bottom of prints. The only recommendation from the creator is a slight bump of 5 or so Celsius for the bed temp. I printed out the official LED riser created by the developer of the project in PETG. These are fairly simple parts that are wide enough for the LEDs, dovetail together, and have an opening to run the wires through. On my first attempt, I didn't raise the bed temp and ended up having a bit of warping. Looking at the sliced file, the dovetail section is a very small island for part of the print, so I raised the temp and added a few mouse ears on my next go. Adhesion was great with the higher bed temp, and even when cooled, held onto the parts. I'm sure material and tolerance will have an effect, but the dovetails for my printed parts were fairly loose. While you can add a bit of glue to secure them together, once it's in place it holds fine, so I left it as is. Next, I routed the LEDs around the inner rim and ran the wires for them out the back. The instructions for flashing the firmware are straightforward, and all you need from your printer is its IP, serial number, and access code that are found on the screen under settings. I used some VHB strips to mount this to the back of my X1 Carbon and used Steve Build's VHB cable tie wire management prints to clean up both the wiring on the back and the wiring inside for the filter. I went with ABS for these parts and even with raising the bed temp and cleaning it well, I had adhesion issues, so I'll have to try ABS again at a later date. I ended up swapping it out for a PEI bed from BQ and adhesion was much stronger. I'm using a 24 volt barrel jack power supply into the controller for the LEDs, so I used these screw down terminals on the other side to power the 12 volt fans in my bento box. Now, whenever this is connected, my fans run and filter out the inside of the printer. If you're looking to brighten the inside of your machine, there's really no comparison to before and after. I put the squirtle in there one more time for comparison, and the difference is really night and day. The last upgrade we're installing is the BQ Panda Jetpack. This is an MJF front cover that replaces the stock front cover, giving it a custom look and integrates the Panda Jet with omnidirectional part cooling. Installation has you remove the two screws holding the fan and LED PCB out of the stock housing and the two screws holding the 5015 blower in place. The same screws and parts are then used to reinstall in the jetpack. While I do think it looks awesome, I was really curious to see if there was any real improvement to cooling. I've seen some other options for fan ducting before, but I hadn't tested any of them out until now. For this, I ran two prints. One was an overhang test that has an overhang facing both directions on X and Y, and another that was a bridging test starting at 10 millimeters and increasing to 100 millimeters. For the overhang test, I really couldn't see any difference between the two, but I'll put some shots on screen so you can see for yourself. For the bridging test, I also thought they looked the same while printing, but once I turned them over, I saw a pretty clear difference. The stock shroud had much more sagging on just about all bridges that increased as the bridges became longer. While the Panda Jet also experienced the sag, it was much less. There were a handful of other upgrades I wanted to cover in this video, but due to the sheer length and footage, I decided to call it here. Some of the other items were Panda Branch, Panda Power, and Panda Hub, which make more sense for my P1S. An assortment of build plates from BQ that are powder coated PEI on both sides, or one side with smooth, one side with a pattern, and their cryo grip. I also have a carbon fiber bed from Wham Bam, but I've been playing around with it on the Magneto X, so it will be getting its own video at a later date. The last item is X1 Plus, which is a custom firmware for the X1 Carbon printer. There's now an official third-party firmware from Bamboo Lab that gets installed so that you can add the X1 Plus firmware. This project has had another major release, and they're even working on a hardware board that gives you the ability to use Ethernet, remote shutter, LED strips, and programmable RGB LEDs. If there's interest in me covering this in a separate video, let me know in the comments. Whew. That was a lot to cover, and hopefully you have a better idea if some of these upgrades do or don't make sense for your specific setup. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments down below and I'll do my best to answer. And as always, if I don't know the answer to your question, I have no problem reaching out to the manufacturers to try to get those answers for you. 
On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video just about every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel further, I'll have links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.